Look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our growth comes through the scriptures. Join me once again this morning in Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29, we left off last week looking at the, uh, uh, the poor, the issue of poverty here in Proverbs 29, 7. The righteous is concerned for the rights of the poor. The wicked does not understand such concern. And uh, we'll be dealing with the issues here this morning related to poverty, but related to the equal administration of justice. And that's really the, uh, the impact of what we're dealing with in, uh, in this passage. So before we do get started, let's take a moment for silent prayer, humbling our hearts and preparing for truth. Shall we pray? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word and the privilege and blessing we have to assemble together. Father, we pray for clarity, we pray for concentration, that our class today would not be distracted by all the construction across the street and in the street. Um, So Father, that's in your hands too. Just thank you and praise you, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, so Proverbs 29, 7. And in A lot of folks think this is a heading for the verses that follow, and looking at the poetic structure of it, it seems like that's probably the case. Verses 8 through 11 uh, is uh, a series of verses that all center on different aspects of society and the breakdown of culture in society. And so uh, we'll get to that when we get to main point 7 in the outline. We'll look at verses 8 through 11, where a city breaks down or a society breaks down in the courts and on the streets. And we'll see what happens. And as we read through those verses, we're going to think, well, golly, that kind of sounds like America today. It kind of sounds like we're, we're living this right now in our, in our experience. But before we get to that, we can look at verse 7 here really as a, as a heading. And it comes down to the attitudes that are uh, reflected. There's a righteous attitude and there's a wicked attitude. And the translation of being concerned, stop that. The uh, translation, being concerned, knows the cause, could be a way to render the Hebrew there. Uh, Concerned for the rights of the poor. And it comes down to their rights, it comes down to their cause, it comes down to their standing in society, their standing in culture, their standing in the courts or in the gates of the city. Whereas the wicked does not know, the wicked does not have the knowledge of that uh, concern. And so this is what we have to deal with. Righteous concern for the poor. Righteous concern for the poor. Do you want, are you concerned for the poor? Is it a righteous concern or is it a wicked concern? And what is the basis for that concern? How do they concern you? Why do they concern you? And on what basis uh, does that concern then motivate your treatment of them? That's what, we, that's what it comes down to. And the, the centerpiece here is their rights. What is their judicial standing in complete fairness, in complete um, equality with every other citizen in the culture, every other resident of the city or, or tribe or country or whatever venue you're looking at for, uh, for the political uh, considerations. So righteous concern for the poor centers on their righteous, just treatment. Okay, the righteous and just treatment. If, if you're treating them differently than anybody else, then it's not righteous and it's not just. If you're treating them worse, in other words, you're abusing them, you're victimizing them, you're, you're, that, then that's not righteous, that's not just. If you're using them to victimize somebody else, that's not righteous and that's not just either. And so unequal treatment can go two directions. You can treat them worse or you can treat them better. Why would you treat them better? Because you're treating somebody else worse by treating them better. And uh, some of these are the manipulations that we have whenever uh, the politics of covetousness, the politics of envy step in and uh, government decides that they can can feed on people's envy and, uh, and maintain political power. So, that's the, uh, that's the contrast there. Not concerned for the, um, the, the finances of the poor, although you can find other verses that obviously, where we want to be generous, we want to be gracious. Um, and, and Proverbs addresses this repeatedly. 
okay? But this verse does not focus on their finances. It doesn't focus on their housing. It doesn't focus on their clothing. It doesn't focus on their food. What are they eating, okay? And we understand that these are real issues, that, uh, that every human needs, needs clothing and needs food and needs, you know, if we have food and covering with this, we shall be content. There are, there are basic human needs that everybody has, and we understand that. And every uh, family understands that, every clan, every tribe, every nation understands that, that these are, these are human needs. But the emphasis here is on righteousness. The emphasis here is on justice, on the equal treatment as under the law. And that, and that needs to be the concern. We can't violate that in the name of trying to handle food and money and clothing and housing and, and all the other things that, that the poor needs. Okay? Am I making sense? I'm not denying that the poor needs those things. But the emphasis of this passage is on just treatment, not on the, uh, the BIOS life provisions. So let's be clear on that. Uh, Proverbs 29.7 is not the only passage that addresses that. We'll have it coming up uh, in, a, in a longer discourse in Proverbs 31, when the mother of King Lemuel is urging him uh, to be a good king, to be a godly king, and not to be chasing women, and not to be getting drunk, not to be using his kingly authority to be uh, enriching himself or, or dominating other people. And so Proverbs 31, I think, the words of King Lemuel, the oracle, We'll talk about that translation, uh, which his mother taught him. What, O my son, and uh, what, O son of my womb, and what, O son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women or your ways to that which destroys kings. Okay, it's like way of kings. <laughs> okay, and the, the wisdom of his mother here saying, these are the things that will tear you apart. They'll destroy your throne. They'll destroy your, your ministry as king of, of a nation. And the first one on the list there is women. <laughs> okay? Do not give your strength to women. Verse 4, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink. Okay, so there's the second item that will destroy you, is drug and, drugs and alcohol and, and, and uh, addictions and uh, losing your faculties. You need all your faculties to, to be a godly ruler. This is why Solomon prayed for wisdom, so that he could be a godly ruler over uh, the people of God. For they will drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Now this is parallel, and even though it says afflicted, this is a term for the, uh, the poor. And again, we have the rights, the judgment. Okay, Very similar language to what we have in our verse this morning in Proverbs 29. And so you, you, you're either upholding their rights or you are perverting their rights. And, and the righteous doesn't pervert, the righteous upholds. It's the wicked that perverts, because the wicked has other nefarious motivations to, uh, to do so. So perverting the rights of all the afflicted. And this is what it's about. This is where the role of uh, governance in, in the executive capacity, the role of uh, justice in the judicial capacity, all of these things should be established uh, on, on the basis of, of equality, on the basis of equal treatment under the law, with, with a blindfold on, that you're not going to be partial to, uh, to uh, certain people in, uh, in perversions of justice. So that's verse 5, and it's not the only verse. We also have verse 8 and verse 9. Uh, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth, judge righteously. Okay, so the open mouth means you're giving a voice to somebody that wouldn't otherwise have a voice, that you're speaking on their behalf, you're representing them, you're becoming an advocate, right? And an advocate is not, uh, is not a, an unrighteous advocate. You have to be advocating on the standard of justice. You're not politicking for extra rights. You're not politicking for um, unfair advantage. You're just advocating, voicing God's standard of justice. So open your mouth for the mute. They don't have a voice. They don't have a voice because of their poverty, because of whatever their circumstances are, because of, of an unjust uh, uh, situation. So Lemuel's mother wants him to, to remedy that, to end the unjust systems, to overthrow the unjust courts, 
to make sure that those without voices have voices. Open your mouth, judge righteously. Defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy. Now, in any of these verses, do you see um, give them what they need? Are there any of these verses that say, oh, they're needy, you need to pay them? You need to uh, give them the cash so that they're not needy anymore? Do they have the right to wealth? Do they have the right to somebody else's money because they don't have any? And this is why we want to be clear on what is righteousness, what is justice, what is equal treatment? What are they entitled to? Okay? Because the people you're stealing from, do they not also have rights? And, and are you going to advocate, uh, is it right to, to steal from one, to, to give to somebody else what they're not entitled to? These are the questions you have to resolve biblically. And, and of course, once you start addressing these issues, uh, you'll be amazed at the names that you get called and the other things that, that, uh, that because subjectivity and emotionalism will take over. And, and you're, just, uh, you're just a mean person, okay? Because you don't, you don't love the poor, okay? No, I, I defend the rights of the poor and the needy. That's a righteous concern for the rights of the poor. And we're going to be clear on that too. Uh, Job is our great example on this. As uh, Job made a career out of this before the events of chapter 1 and 2 unfold, we have a flashback scene where Job is reminiscing about his days gone by. And uh, as he talks about this, I think we read this last week too, for that. Now it's jogging my memory here. When I went out to the gate of the city, when I took my seat in the square, the young men saw me and hid themselves, and the old men arose and stood. And you can imagine if uh, you know, you're, you're, trying, you're going to try a case in court, and then you find out that Job's on the other side, you realize, okay, I lost this case. <laughs> right? You know, why? Just, let's come back on a different day when, when Job's not in the court. Uh, princes stopped talking. They put their hands on their mouths. The voice of the nobles was hushed. Their tongue stuck to their palate. For when the ear heard, it called me blessed. When the eye saw, it gave witness of me. And so there was just universal admiration for Job in his judicial fairness. That's key. Okay? The judicial fairness, that he was a font, a font of wisdom. And that, uh, that uh, what else could be said when, when his wisdom was uttered? And so I delivered the poor who cried for help and the orphan who had no helper. Again, this is the role of an advocate. You speak for the one that doesn't have a voice. You help the one that doesn't have, otherwise doesn't have the help, doesn't have the representation. The blessing of the one ready to perish came upon me, and I made the widow's heart sing for joy. If you don't have righteous governance, these are the, these are the first victims. The women and children, the orphans and widows, they're going to be the first to be victimized in a might-makes-right lawless culture. That's why you've got to have righteous standards of governance. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. You know, you can almost view this like the armor of God passage in Ephesians 6. You can view this as the garments where, when you're in fellowship and you're walking in the light and you are uh, reflecting God's standards. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame, a father to the needy, and I investigated the case which I did not know. So again, this is the proper role of an advocate. I keep using that word, advocate. Jesus Christ is our advocate. He's our defense attorney. He represents us at the Father's right hand. There is a legitimate role for an advocate. In our culture today, I think the term advocate is largely abused because it means a crusader. It means, a, it means somebody who is championing a cause ostensibly they're advocating for the poor, but are they really? Or are they promoting their agenda with, with other motivations in view? Okay. Are they truly representing the poor? And are they arguing for righteousness and justice? Are they arguing for equal treatment? Or are they arguing for special treatment, special privileges? Um, are, they, are they advocating for... Um, 
benefits that the, uh, the afflicted are not worthy of, they're not deserving of, they're not entitled to, because if everybody's not worthy of it, then nobody's worthy of it. Am I, am I making sense? We're, we're, talking about, we're talking about equal standing as unto the Lord. And it's not on the relative scale of who has more and who has less. In some cases, maybe it's best to just back up and go to volition, and start with that, and then go to marriage, then go to family, and then and, and see how these things apply in um, see how these things apply. That's really bugging me. Let me see if I can. Oh, that might ruin the uh, the stream. All right. Glenn told me there were issues on Sunday as well. Is that correct? It might just be time to buy a brand new projector. (laughs) Well, this is why I'm not a uh, tech person. All right. We'll go old school, the old-fashioned way. Jesus didn't have a projector. <laughs> is uh, Christopher? Is my stream still coming through? You think so? Okay. So at least people watching on Subsplash can still see the the screen. All right. Well, we're dealing with this righteous concern for the poor, and this was Job's example. Um, the, the poor who cried for help, the orphan who had no helper. The blessing of one ready to perish came upon me. I made the widow's heart sing for joy. Um, eyes to the blind, feet to the lame, a father to the needy. I investigated the case which I did not know. All right, so there has to be investigation. There has to, you have to look into it. This is why it's always best to do this at the most local level where you, have, you can get the facts, you can talk to the witnesses, you can talk to the people on hand, and you can find out the truth of a matter. Because he says, I broke the jaws of the wicked and I snatched the prey from his teeth. So this is, there is a real uh, uh, victimization that's happening here. Breaking the jaws of the wicked Snatching the prey from his teeth, that tells you that this poor person, this afflicted person, this, this case that Job is advocating for has a, uh, a, a, uh, a wicked party. There's a criminal involved. There's somebody that's hurting this person. And so this is not just a civil matter. This is a, a criminal matter. This, is, this has to be dealt with. The afflicted person has to be rescued from those jaws, and then those jaws have to be broken. And this would be the case in, in, in any uh, culture, in, in, a, in a city, a state, a country, wherever, where uh, you have criminals that have victimized people and those people have suffered because of those criminals. Well, then those criminals should, should pay the recompense and there needs to be justice. <coughs> and that's a legitimate function of any judicial system. Now, what happens, though, if you investigate and you find that there is no criminal, that, that the, the poverty is to blame for the, 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 the person that was a sluggard, the person that didn't work, the person that was a, a, an alcoholic, and, 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 and he wants to blame somebody else for his poor decisions, well, that has to be investigated too. And, and if, if you're reaping what you're sowing, that's justice. Because the God of justice wove that into the fabric of creation. We make decisions and we face consequences. That's the image of God and that's righteousness and justice at work. And so um, to, to simply to, to treat all need on the same basis, to say, well, this person has a need. Are you investigating where that need came from? What's the cause of that need? What promoted that need? then it may be that just throwing money at it is not the will of God, because that's not justice. 
We'll talk about some of those issues there too. Okay? And I really do want the project, maybe we'll try one more time. See if we can get that back on again. That way you can see the, uh, the verses we're looking at and you can also see some of the other um, resources that, uh, that are available, that you have available in your own Logos installation. And you can use these to read through the, the different articles as they apply to, uh, to different topics that you might be studying. All right. Because trust me, you want to use your Logos Bible software resources. Uh, you don't want to go to Google and ask Google, what does the Bible say about poverty? Okay? And that's going to take you places you don't want to go. And uh, you'll convert to communism and you'll become a theological liberal. Google will take you where you don't want to go. One last thing. Nope. Well, thank you, Lord. So, uh, we looked at Job. Let's look at Isaiah 10. Isaiah 10, 2. Woe to those who enact evil statutes and to those who constantly record unjust decisions. God's involved, okay? And, and every level of governance is, is uh, in God's hands, including executive, judicial, legislative branches, things like that. But enacting evil statutes. The God of justice is not pleased with those evil statutes. And constantly recording unjust decisions, perversions of justice, are offensive to the God of justice. And he pronounces woe. These divine, uh, these divine establishments are designed to be reflections of God's nature. That's true for marriage, that's true for family, that's true for nations. So notice these unjust decisions so as to deprive the needy of justice and rob the poor of my people of their rights. Okay? Again, it's justice and it's rights. This is the offense against the justice of God. The other things, you know, taking money from them and food off their table and, and clothes off their back and, and uh, victimizing them in, in different ways, you know, holding their cloak as a pledge or other things... Those are just symptoms, reflections of the miscarriage of justice that is, is the offense against the righteousness of God. Depriving the needy of justice and robbing the poor, my people, of their right, so that widows may be their spoil, that they may plunder the orphans. Now, what will you do in the day of punishment and in the devastation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where uh, will you leave your wealth? And so the judgment comes, and they thought they could uh, build up their own house, build up their own wealth, build up their own political legacy by uh, stealing from their political enemies. And uh, the God of justice is, is, says, no, there's consequences for this. And uh, it is a woe message. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 28. Jeremiah 5. All right, and let's see. I'm going to back way up to verse 20, just so we have a larger context. Jeremiah 5.20. And again, I'm sorry about the projector. You have to look at your own Bible today. How about that, instead of staring at the wall? Declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Now hear this, O foolish and senseless people. When God starts name-calling, that gets your attention. O foolish and senseless people who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. In other words, you're just saturated with human viewpoint. 
All you can see in here are the earthly stuff. You're not opening your spiritual eyes. You're not opening your spiritual ears. You're not listening to Bible doctrine. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble in my presence? This is what happens. You lose the fear of the Lord. You lose your, your uh, hunger for Bible doctrine. For I have placed the sand as a boundary for the sea, an eternal decree, so it cannot cross over it. Though the waves toss, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot cross over it. Some people think that sounds a little bit out of place there. I like it. When God is just reminding you, by the way, have you forgotten who I am? I'm the God that keeps the ocean from covering the whole planet. Okay? I keep the shore where it belongs, right there at the boundary of ocean and land. Okay? We call that the shore. And, and you're on land because I'm a God of grace and promise never to flood this world again. This people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God, who gives rain in its season, both the autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. That day in and day out, month after month, and season after season, God is the faithful one. And, and why are we losing our faith? Why are we losing our fear of him? He's the same God he's always been. We should maintain our fear constantly. Your iniquities have turned these away and your sins have withheld good from you. Now here we go. For wicked men are found among my people. And this is what happens. You have a general disregard for the word of God. You have a general, you've, you've, the culture has lost its fear of the Lord. And so why are you shocked now that, that wicked men are in political power? Why are you shocked now that there's cultural rot that's, that's tearing your, your civilization apart? They watch, wicked men, they watch like fowlers lying in wait. They set a trap. They catch men like a cage full of birds so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and rich. And it can be profitable to victimize your fellow citizens. That's why they do it. They are fat, they are sleek, they excel in deeds of wickedness. They do not plead the cause the cause of the orphan that they may prosper. They do not defend the rights of the poor. And so they've, they've actually flipped the legitimate purpose of government on its head. They're using it to advance themselves instead of serving the people. Shall I not punish these people, declares the Lord? <laughs> How can I not? You know, it's like when, when Nathan convicted David with that little parable he told about the poor man and the lamb and you know, he told that parable and Nathan got David so invested in that story. David was furious. He says, that man must die. And then Nathan springs the trap and says, yeah, and you're the man, right? Something similar I think is happening here in describing all of this wicked governance. And then the Lord says, shall I not punish these people? You know, and, and we cry out for, it. we say, yes, injustice is horrible. This is where even unbelievers, even atheists, I was talking to one last weekend. Atheists who don't believe in God, they still have a conscience, a God-given image of God conscience that recoils when they see injustices. And they say, well, that's wrong. That's not fair. That's, that shouldn't happen. I don't know how they can claim that if they don't believe there's a God and an absolute standard of justice. But still, built into their humanity in the image of God is this conscience that can identify injustice. And they can get incensed at things that aren't fair, or that aren't right. Shall I not punish these people? On a nation such as this, shall I not avenge myself? Because beyond the widows that are being victimized and the poor people that are being victimized, God himself must be avenged. His standard of righteousness and justice has been besmirched. His character, his, his name, his integrity. This is, this is defiance against the, the Lord God of the universe. And that's not the, well, the chapter has two more verses. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule on their own authority. And my people love it so. But what will you do at the end of it? Okay. Well, we're going to find out, won't we? When the hand of God's judgment uh, strikes this nation. All right, so that's Jeremiah 5. Also, Jeremiah twenty-two sixteen. 16. 
And um, again, there's a larger... We'll back up to verse 13 here. Jeremiah 22, 13. Woe to him who builds his house without righteousness and his upper rooms without justice, who uses his neighbor's services without pay and does not give him his wages, who says, I will build myself a roomy house with spacious upper rooms and cut out its windows, paneling it with silver, uh, cedar and painting it bright red. Okay. So you have secular wealth and you have temporal life success. You've got a great big house. Great for you. Where is your righteousness? Where is your justice? Where is your fear of the Lord? Do you become a king because you are competing in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. See, it's not your income. It's not your uh, material success. He pled the cause of afflicted and needy. Then it was well. Is not that what it, it means to know me, declares the Lord? But your eyes and your heart are intent only upon your own dishonest gain and on shedding innocent blood and on practicing oppression and extortion. Whatever it takes to get ahead, whoever you have to step on, whoever you have to climb over, whoever gets hurt, you don't care because you're serving yourself and your own material advancement. This is a, this is a serious uh, indictment here. Remember, uh, Jeremiah was ministering in the final kings of Judah and none of them were good. After, after Josiah, there was no more good king ever again in, uh, in Judah. All right, so we have the issues there. If you want more on this, obviously the Bible does say a tremendous amount about poverty. I would recommend, and I was going to try to give you a display today, but the Lord's not cooperating. The Lord has other plans. Um... But in your software, open up the fact book. Open up the fact book and either type in poor or type in poverty. Uh, they'll take you to the same place. You get a report on, on, uh, on biblical uh, poverty. On, on the, the, let me just open it up and read it. You can't see it, but um, if you're watching the stream, you can see it. Opening up the fact book for poverty. And it'll give you your key article from the Lexham Theological Workbook, if you have that in your library. Um, Good information there showing you the different uh, vocabulary, Hebrew vocabulary, uh, Greek vocabulary. I think it's useful to go through those verses and see the usages on them. So, uh, and you can see in particular the centerpiece for all biblical teaching is Proverbs. It's the, the book we're in right now. It's the centerpiece for applying God's wisdom, having the fear of the Lord where our, our spiritual walk shapes our uh, shapes our, our earthly walk, where we have standards of righteousness based upon the Word of God, and that shapes how we conduct ourselves in life, how we conduct our finances, how we conduct our, conduct our business dealings, how we conduct our, our um, uh, community uh, life in, in, uh, in society. It's where personal wisdom becomes public wisdom. And uh, it'll also give you some different uh, Bible dictionaries, Bible encyclopedias, different references. If you have journals, it'll show you those journal articles, different things. The, the, the fact book is a great go-to source, and I recommend it for folks. Start there and then see, because it'll search your library for you, and it'll show you resources that you have available that maybe you didn't even realize had, uh, had information there pertaining to that. Um, I'm just going to open up one thing with respect to this. Understand, as you're reading these resources, they're not the Bible, and some of them have theological um, bents. Some of them have prejudices. Okay? You may also find that you've got some pretty liberal resources in your library. Uh, you know, Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, but just mark it for what it is and say, okay, this is their view, and they're trying to defend it biblically. And just read with discernment, okay? Especially if you're going to be a pastor someday. You've got to be reading these resources with discernment and filter through, because you can glean proper things, even from terrible resources. Some of that stuff we'll, we'll bring up next Wednesday morning, and we'll start dealing with this. Um, I just wanted to find one quote, because one of these dictionaries insulted the book of Proverbs and said that the Proverbs' view on poverty was um, 
I forget the exact word they used. They said the Proverbs view on poverty was uh, insulting or was um, unbalanced. They had, they had a phrase and it just I made me cringe as I read it. Because Proverbs went so far as to say that uh, the sluggard is going to end up with, with poverty. And the theological bent of the Bible dictionary that was commenting upon that felt that it was too harsh, that it wasn't loving, that it was wrong. No, I think this theologian is wrong. I think the Bible is right. How about that? Okay? And, uh, and if we're going to be a critique, if we're going to start ripping up parts of our Bible that, we, that don't conform to our, to our 21st century uh, political views, then uh, let's just be honest enough about it and say, my political views are, uh, are at odds with the Scriptures. Okay? And one of those has to change, and it's the Scriptures that are going to abide forever, not somebody's political views. So we want to be clear on that. So... Um, Yeah, and let's see if I'm going to find... I may have to go home and find it later and then post it in the group so you can see. But it was one of these, Anchor Bible Dictionary maybe, and, and it just it jumped out at me. Here we go. The Wisdom Tradition. So this is the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary article on poverty. The wisdom tradition divides over the question of poverty. Proverbs, in a somewhat condescending and possibly censorious tone. What? You're calling Proverbs condescending? Um, and, and somewhat censorious tone. I think the whole Bible is censorious. The Bible will rebuke. The Bible will reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction promotes the traditional wisdom view that poverty is the undesirable consequence of laziness. Well, yeah. Okay. If a man will not work, neither let him eat. You've got, and that's not even Proverbs, that's the New Testament. Okay. Job and Ecclesiastes understand poverty to be the result of political and economic exploitation. It can be, doesn't always have to be. More often than not, it's just personal laziness. The Psalms display a rich language for poverty, and many texts discuss God's concern for the poor, at least in general terms. Then he goes on, outside these blocks of literature, the topic of poverty is treated only occasionally. Uh, that's That's a flat out lie. I mean, it's just wrong. He says, the narrative literature of the Pentateuch is unconcerned with the issue. False, wrong, lie. Okay? Because you go to the Pentateuch, you go to Mosaic Law, and you know what you find out? You find out that he is very concerned with the poor, and that uh, the reason why you have gleanings in the field, the reason why you, you uh, have uh, the corners of your, of your plot are left unreaped, uh, is because you have provision that's made for the poor, for the widow, for the stranger, for the alien, that they can go. But see, here's the thing. Those government programs, those law-mandated provisions for the poor, require them to work. They've got to go out in the field and they've got to gather the wheat. They've got to go out in the field and, and gather the, the, the food that they're going to eat. They've got to go and do the work for it. There's, there's extensive legislation about this. It's throughout the Pentateuch. You've got the very story of the Exodus itself, where they were brought out of bondage. That is the object lesson for why, as a nation, the Jewish people are supposed to be gracious towards the poor. Because they themselves were in bondage and and were brought free. That's supposed to be motivation for them in how they deal with the widows and the orphans and the poor and the alien and the stranger. So to say that the narrative literature of the Pentateuch is unconcerned with the issue is just a flat-out misrepresentation. And I think this is a liberal resource that's using um, their platform to promote their agenda rather than what the Bible really says about poverty. Okay? Anyway, so just be be aware of that. And uh, Proverbs is not condescending. Proverbs is, uh, is right on target in, uh, in what it teaches related to 
the diligent versus the sluggard. All right, let's get on into point seven. And this is Proverbs 29, verses 8 through 11. And we're going to handle them all together as one unit. 8, 9, 10, 11. And you should see the, the parallels and you should see the, uh, the poetry that, that is, is in each of these verses here. So Proverbs 29, 8. Scorners set a city aflame, but wise men turn away anger. What, when a wise man has a controversy with a foolish man, the foolish man either rages or laughs, and there is no rest. Men of bloodshed hate the blameless, but the upright are concerned for his life. And then verse 11, a fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. All right, so 8, 9, 10, 11, all four of these verses... Uh, each, each verse by themselves has an A and a B part in a contrast, but all four of these together as a unit show you a, uh, a breakdown in society. And this is why in point seven I phrased it this way, a city or a society breaks down in the courts and on the streets. In the courts and on the streets. When the scorners, the fools, and the violent are openly hostile against the wise, the blameless, and the upright. I'll say that again. The scorners, the fools, and the violent, they are openly hostile against the wise, the blameless, and the upright. If you think about it, you know, we talk about the culture wars and the things that our, our nation is, is ripping us apart, uh, and, and it's, it's true. It's what we're looking at. You have the scorners, the fools, and the violent. That's the crowd that's no fear of the Lord, no, uh, no understanding of Bible doctrine, probably not even saved, okay? Or sadly, maybe they are saved, uh, but they're not living in the fear of the Lord. They're not living the, the principles of, of Bible doctrine. And so they're called scorners, and they set the city aflame. They're called fools. And uh, even if they are taken to court, they don't care. They laugh or they rage. The, the judicial ruling against them is, is no concern to them. What do they care? The men of blameless bloodshed who hate the blameless versus the upright who are concerned for their life. Again, we've got two sides to the culture here. The one side is, is grounded in the fear of the Lord and is shaped by Bible doctrine. The other side is open chaos. And I think we're going to see this. Burning cities? Who's doing that? Okay? It's not the, it's not the evangelicals burning the cities. Okay? It's not the God-fearing believers uh, living out the, the Word of God. Who is it that's burning the cities? Um, having a controversy and raging or laughing. And there is no rest. There is no rest. And regardless of what the judicial ruling is, it doesn't, it doesn't change the behavior. It doesn't provide any uh, remedy to the one that's truly been injured. He just laughs about it. Okay? Because he commits his crimes and he's actually released out on with no bail, no consequences. He's walking the streets again before the paperwork's even filed. And then hating the blameless. The men of bloodshed hate the blameless. And Jesus said, don't be surprised about this. They're going to hate you. But understand, they hate me before they hated you. But why does the, the man of bloodshed hate the blameless? Why does the wicked hate the righteous? Well, because darkness always hates light. And, and the hatred against the, uh, you know, the, the desire to bring us into harm, do we return that? Do we return evil for evil? Do we hate them right back? Do we want to see them dead? Or do we love instead? Do we, do we seek their benefit? Do we seek, as it says here, men of bloodshed hate the blameless, but the upright are concerned for his life. It seems like it's a one-way uh, treatment, right? Not returning evil for evil, but returning a blessing instead. And we pray for their salvation. We pray for their... I mean, that's ultimately, isn't that, doesn't that give God the greater glory? Isn't there more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents? 
then the, uh, so yeah, I, I labeled this as the one-sided civility. It only goes one direction. And um, Jesus addresses that too in, in John 15 and in Luke 6. And then the anger-driven community relations, losing his temper, uh, a wise man holds it back, okay? And this is in the context of governance, in the context of, of uh, public dealings, business in the gates, other things there. That you, Again, you want your, your judge to be ruling um, impartially with a blindfold on, not showing favoritism to his friends and not punishing his enemies, and certainly not uh, handing down a sentence because... Uh, because of a temper tantrum that he's that he's throwing on the on the bench, okay? Because for whatever reason he got he got mad at the at the defendant, so he holds him in contempt and gets gets an angry temper tantrum and fines him and puts him in jail and does all these things. And you wonder, are you a judge or is this a, is this a, are we are we back in in junior high? <laughs> what are we doing here? It seems to be uh, something happening. So anyway, that's uh, that's verses eight through eleven and. Um, Again, I really wanted the screen for this. Hmm. Well, let's start um, talking about these burning cities. It's not the first time that we've had violence mentioned here in the book of Proverbs. Okay, uh, Proverbs fifteen eighteen. We had a verse there that addressed this. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. You know, when you're on the streets, when you're face to face and, and something happens, how do you resolve it? Do you have, uh, do you have the, the fruit of the Spirit? Are you calm? Are you going to say, okay, well, let's resolve this? And how, how do you resolve it? Do you resolve it um, in a civil fashion? You have a dispute with your neighbor? Do you, do you take it to the city gates? Do you talk to the elders? Are you going to arrange this appropriately? Again, this is why we have volition, we have marriage, we have family, we have nationalism, and at each level are biblical procedures for dealing with, with issues, dealing with conflict, dealing with, with things, okay? And uh, you want to use those mechanisms, the, the divine establishment mechanisms, to resolve the conflict. You don't just want to grab up swords and go to war. You don't want to just have a, a temper fit and go, go kill somebody. So... Proverbs uh, deals with it there. 26.21 Like charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. This is true on the personal level, true in marriage, true in families, true in government, true in, in the, the society at large. God designed these things at every level of, of human interaction. So are you feeding the dispute or are you dampening it? Are you adding fuel to the fire or are you throwing water on it? Okay, obviously what would, what would doctrine have you do? What would wisdom have you do? What would the fruit of the Spirit have you do? It's not to return evil for evil. It's not to return a curse for a curse, but to return a blessing instead. Proverbs 29.22. Uh, so that's further down in the chapter we're in now. An angry man stirs up strife, and a hot-tempered man abounds in transgression. James 3, verses 5 and 6. This is in the New Testament. Okay? Sometimes we call the book of James the, the wisdom literature of the Greek New Testament. It's like the book of Proverbs for the church age because it's, it's so full of, of practical wisdom for daily application. But in James 5, he says, The tongue is a small part of the body, yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. It uses the same language of fire to talk about how destructive uh, the tongue can be. The tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life is set on fire by hell. Now, this is true, it's eternally true, it's timeless, but consider how much more true it is today not more true, but more um, devastating it is today. It used to be that the tongue was only as damaging as the periphery of you know, how, how far people could hear you, right? So you could stir up an immediate crowd. You could stir up a, a local little group, you know, depending on how many people you could shout to and how many people you could influence. 
But think about what we can do now with social media. Think about how now the tongue can go global. And you can, your, your lies, your slander, your calls to violence, your, your um, uh, calls for whatever can be around the globe in, in seconds now. And then think about that fire that's not just limited to the immediate periphery, but now can just be multiplied across everywhere. So the tongue, it's always been a fire, but now it's a fire that can reach out in ways that was never able to reach out before. And while I'm, I'm thankful that we have the internet, I'm thankful that we have uh, apps, I'm thankful for technology even when it doesn't work, okay? Because it works most of the time. But I'm thankful that we can communicate like this, that you know, pastor friends in Cameroon can text you and your cell phone will buzz in your pocket and you go, oh man, I gotta be praying for my pastor friends in Cameroon right now. They're hiding in the jungle and getting shot at. I, I like the capacity to have instantaneous prayer, but do we need that? You know, the Holy Spirit can cover the, the needed prayers as needed, when needed. And, and in my sanctified ignorance, do I need my pocket to buzz to be praying for, for believers in, in, in Pakistan or, or Israel or, or, or what have you? I don't know. I think um, the damage that's done is horrible when, uh, when evil is coordinated through the communication tools that we have available to us today. Anyway, we'll come back. Um, this is probably a good stopping point anyway. It's a little bit early, but remember, we do have to clear out of here quickly. They are going to be closing off the entrance, and if we're not um, that, uh, I think you said until 4.30? 4 o'clock. Okay, 4 o'clock, yeah. So you, you drove over that big metal plate coming into the parking lot today. They're going to have that open, and uh, they're going to be working on water mains and whatever other utilities that are in there. So... If, uh, if you don't get your car out before they open that, uh, you won't get your car out until, uh, until they close that. So, uh, yeah. All right, Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, pray for the technology and the, the deacons that, uh, that get this stuff working right. So thank you for being faithful.